Okay, we're talking about the benefits of AI power. And I'm going to go back into, I heard a good question earlier, but we'll touch on that when I hit that slide. Um, benefits of AI power. The experience. I can bring a lot more compute power to the problems that we have if we know what we're doing and we get the metrics. That's what we've been doing. We've been working very hard on that. Today, we're going to talk about maximizing efficiency, AI-driven decisions in the RF space. We're going to talk about uh, reducing interruptions with AI channel planning on the Meraki stack. We're going to talk about minimizing channel changes with an auto busy hour and the AI inclusions in the auto RF. First, and this is when I heard about what about DNA Center. Well, DNA Center runs AI enhanced RRM, and we've already integrated that with the data lake that we have and the back end for the Catalyst product set. The North Star vision for this is that's a lot of experience and a lot of work that we've done with a lot of time already invested in that. And it's working really, really well. I'll give you an update on that because we talked about AI enhanced RRM at the last field day. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on demos. But that's where we're going with this. And we think what we can do with that is bring immediately benefits that we've engineered into this to the entire Cisco customer base. So the first, and we've already done this, I've plugged in AI enhanced RRM. We managed a, uh, a complete Meraki stack. We did this for multiple weeks. We're going back now working on instrumentation. So that's where we're going ultimately. And the reason for this is to provide a consistent experience to our entire customer base. Meraki does a great job with simplification. And I love that because it's really nice and easy to set up a network. If your network grows to a complexity or to a level or to a size where you need advanced management, that should be advanced and available to you in the same dashboard, in the same format. So that's where that's going to go ultimately. Today, and actually, let me double tap on that, industry's most advanced. We also happen to have one of the widest and deepest data lakes. Also on AI enhanced RRM, last time we talked, it had to be a provision controller. The controller needed to be fully managed by DNA Center. That is no longer the case. Coming out in the next release, we will be able to pull a controller on. If you're only using assurance data today, we'll be able to pull a controller on. You will not have to manage that directly from DNAC, which means it's a lot less intrusive. That's going to look like enabling AI enhanced RRM using the same workflow to pull you on board, it's going to take you to a new option to do this without provisioning. You're going to build the AI enhanced RF profile, which there's only one per building required. And the reason there's one per building is because if I give you a great insight and we want to update it, you want to make sure it's for the building the insight was. But only one required. And we're going to be able to push that down to the controller, and it's going to appear in the assurance data, and you're going to get the dashboard that we've already created. Just to make sure I heard you correctly, we can add controllers in DNA Center without necessarily provisioning them. I don't have to go through the entire blasted DNA Center workflow, and I can still get AI RRM. I would like to repeat exactly what you said back to you, because yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I just that wanted to correct. make sure that's what I heard. Because, that's okay. You, you heard that correctly. So that is coming. Um, since we last talked, we did Cisco Impact. When we last talked, we were doing Cisco Live uh, at the present time in a small portion of the Mandalay Bay facility. Afterwards, we went back with Impact, which is a Cisco internal event. I had 15,000 people there. I had almost 1,600 APs. Um, and it was a really, really good test because... Mandalay Bay, we're very familiar with that. We deployed the network in it. We've been there for years. We've run multiple shows there, several generations of hardware. The guys that run that show know that building. So they were comfortable going with AI enhanced RRM uh, because they know what it should look like and they were able to work around that pretty quickly. It was not the drama. It actually did a very, very good job of it. Um, everybody was pretty surprised because we kind of felt like this was at least where we were going to get some lessons uh, on this deployment. What I'm showing you is on the top, and this comes straight out of the dashboard, you can see the RM changes or the numbers of changes. If you put your cursor over top of it, it breaks down exactly what happened, whether it was channel, an FRA role change, uh, a power change, 
whatever happens, you can get extreme details clicking straight from there. But the important things to note are those after hours adjustments. We didn't do anything during the day when that show was operating. What we did was we analyzed that and we decided what changes would optimize for that period of time and then implemented that after the busy hour. So you see the busy hour implementations across three days. Well, about that point, my experienced knock crew said, you know, we usually run this whole venue about 3 dB hotter. Last day of the show, go ahead, crank it up. <laughs> so we did. You see in the top far right corner where we made that change. That's another tenet of this. If somebody makes a configuration change, you will get a notification and that will be imposed on the timeline as well. So every admin has the ability to go back and see why things may have changed and when that happened. And who to blame. And <laughs> which throat to choke, <laughs> as we like to say. Uh, the bottom line shows the RM performance, and that tracks over the entirety of the show as well. We were running very good on the first day. It made some adjustments. Um, we saw the adjustments come in. We made a decision to make a little more fair to get a little more performance in another category. After we made the change, I lost five points in my health, which was really nice because I was able to go back to the guys running the knock and say, machine didn't think your change was a good idea. <laughs> and that started an interesting conversation. Honestly, it impressed all of us pretty well because that facility right now under a catalyst guidance requires five separate RF profiles. And that's the difference between the static configuration. It's a dynamic algorithm, but it's got a very short timeline. It doesn't have that long range view over the road and it can't see and make decisions based on trends. Um, only short term trends. So that's AI enhanced and where we've gone with that. That's going to be coming to the Meraki cloud um, and the Meraki dashboard. And I think it's a great advancement. Reduce. So Jim, just on a question, uh, you mentioned that um, enhanced uh, RM is integrating with Meraki's auto RF. Yes. Is, is it an integration or is it a hostile takeover and replacement? <laughs> it's not a hostile takeover and replacement. I wish I could show you. you got a green sock and a blue sock on right now. So <laughs> it's, it's all good. It's, it's all good. Uh, and uh, no fights either. <laughs> but I guess, are so they taking less? It is, not, it is not a takeover. It is, it is there. You know, there's a lot of customers using Auto RF right now that are happy with it, right? And that, that's a, a great advancement because RRM has tracked through every change since I've been here, every protocol change, managed widening channels and all the differences that we've seen, right? It's got a lot of knobs on it. You kind of have to know what you're doing with that. I love auto RF, you turn it on, that's it. <laughs> you, you let it go. If you've got a couple of special configurations, we've got some RF profiles, but that's attainable. Never want to replace that, okay? If your network, however, grows to the point where you need more information, you need to start doing some specialized configurations, you don't want the complexity of RRM. This is where this plugs in. And what I saw this do at Mandalay Bay was break up those five separate RF profile areas, understand the configuration of those APs, and make really good decisions on what to do with them. So that's the beauty of AI. We've got a lot more data. They can do these things behind the scenes, and we're teaching it to do the things that we know how to do. Um, but so. but but this is this is a for all intents and purposes a third uh, RRM algorithm. You have the one that runs on the controllers. You have the one that runs in the Meraki dashboard, and then you have the AI one that either one can consume. Absolutely. And then you get the same answer so a, from an RF perspective, regardless of the platform. AI enhanced RRM when it was built was built to handle third party input and whatever metrics we can get from it. So right now, what we're doing is we're working on the metrics and we're working on the feeds but the feeds have already been matched up to AI Enhance. It really doesn't care what's on the end as long as it can tell you what channel and power to be on. That's what its job is. Um, and then we also get the benefit of generating insights, right? We've got a lot of experience dumped into the insights engine already. I'm thrilled because I got metrics that used to cost me hours to go and parse. So it's a very simplified uh, RM solution and it provides a lot more power uh, and feedback. So it's an advanced if you wish to upgrade to that, and don't ask me what license I need because I don't have that data yet. <laughs> <laughs> reduce, okay? We want to reduce client disruptions. What disrupts a client? Channel changes, channel planning, right? There's no clean way around that. You break a radio connection to change channels and you have to reestablish. 
So what do we want to do to reduce that? Well, first thing that we brought to this, RM services. Auto RF already has dynamic channel assignment. It has transmit power control. It has dynamic bandwidth services. As an example of the things that the cross-pollination is producing, we're bringing the FRA algorithm over. We have the same hardware now. We have a lot of the same capabilities. Makes sense to give our customers the same benefits and advantages. And this is going to be integrated into uh, Auto RF. The other thing that we've done, and whoever's... The other thing that we've done is this AI channel planning work. What this does now is it actually allows me at each individual AP to look at its local area. And if there's a problem with the channel, if I'm seeing DFS hits or I'm seeing the channel being blocked, this gives me a dynamic way to track that for that AP who's actually having the problem. The AP knows it's the one detecting the problem. And you don't get the same problems building wide. So what we're doing with that is if I get a DFS hit, that goes onto a channel avoid list. The channel avoid list has severity. Severity 6 is the lowest. I'm not going to use that channel for an hour. But before I return that to the channel plan, I'm going to put that into a monitor period. What monitor says is I have to monitor for that period of time. And if I'm able to and not see that event again, then I put it back in the channel ready list. If I see the event again, it goes to a SEV5, a SEV4, a SEV3, and we continue to block just that channel. And when we don't see that problem anymore, we remove that. Prior to this feature being introduced in R30, this is MR30, this feature required that you go in, set an RF profile, lock the channels out manually, and this is the part that usually kills me, go back and remember that you did that later and take it out of there, right? So this automates that entire process. The two things that we're looking at is jam channels, DFS events. The avoid list is per AP. I'm going to show you a demo on that later, so I'm not going to dig into the details. Does it work? Yes, it does. We took a bad site. We added this, uh, this ability with the auto RF, and what we saw was a 50% reduction in just DFS hits, and this was a very bad acting site. So it was an impressive result. Um, where this ties into is minimize client disruption during via, uh, busy hours. Even if we're going to have channel changes, and this excludes DFS hits, <laughs> because you have to move out of the way when you get a DFS hits. But when we have channel changes happening during busy hours, usually that's a result of the load of the network coming up. If I can define busy hours, then I can go ahead and avoid doing those changes during those busy hours. <clears throat> Defining the busy hours is not as easy as you might think. You have different businesses. You've got different functions within your company. You've got different locations around the world. You know what time you come home, and you know what time you go to work. But do you know who else is in that building? You don't. We can monitor that from the cloud. This is by network. And it's very individualized. We're looking at both the traffic load and the number of clients on the network. Either one of those above threshold is going to cause that to be marked as a busy hour. And it literally is just a busy hour. Across that, we're going to generate what we think the opinion of that busy hour is. And we're going to give you an answer. <laughs> is, is that a dynamic threshold? Or is it, it is a, a dynamic threshold, and it adjusts over time, right? Um, one thing I will say, time zone's important. <laughs> if you have a network that has multiple time zones, you're going to get an answer that includes multiple opinions. Um, so you're going to want to be careful about that. Uh, but in the setting up, SFO 12 sits in downtown uh, San Francisco. It's got a lot of neighbors around it, a lot of technology firms. We're sitting next to the edge of a harbor. Um, so this seemed like a really good place. Plus, it's got labs in it and all kinds of other things. You know how dirty the RF gets when everybody's playing with it, right? So this had a lot of channel changes on a daily basis. We turned this on back on, I want to say, the 11th. And we watched three weeks of data prior to, and we watched three weeks of data after engaging. And what we saw was a dramatic reduction in the channel changes during the busy hours. And actually, after hours, we really didn't see a whole lot of optimizations because the network was in pretty good shape at that point in time. During the day, when they're doing a lot of testing, they got a lot of channel chases in there. So this coupled with AI channel planning, um, we expect to make a huge impact. 
And this again is just cloud planning and having the ability to have the data uh, and the experience to use it. Roaming analytics dashboard. Uh, one of the other things that can be very, very difficult to troubleshoot if you've ever done it, it's a joy. How do you get where you need to grab the data? How is the data going to be assembled? Nine times out of 10, you're looking at log files, you're looking at parsing out uh, text files that you pulled down from a debug report. It can be difficult to understand what the experience of that client is. Roaming analytics high level. Um, we're going to be able to show you roaming events, event driven timeline. This is done so that you can see a grouping of an event. That is a one hour slider. So once you drill down on the one hour slider, it opens to the window that you see below. Uh, you can actually take a look at the roaming event. We track five different kinds of events. I've got them in here for reference for you. You can see what time it happened. You can see the context of it, the RSSI from, the RSSI to whether or not this was an 802.11R, 802.11V enabled. So there's a tremendous amount of data in here. If you're having a roaming problem, this is where you're going to drive to. Once you click on and zoom in, because you can see all of those events are pretty close together, you actually can break this down and bring it out into a two-minute event time window. So it expands it out with a zoom so that you can actually get down and see all of the events that may have occurred during that period of time. We think this is going to save an awful lot of time in sorting it out. Uh, always a roam is the client's decision, and that's a hard conversation to have when you're having a problem with it. Um, Jim, are, are there any uh, integrations with visualizations to estimate where the position of that client is on a map and correlate it with that data as well? Well, it's giving you the AP name and we do know where the AP name is, right? Right. Um, so I can see the roam from, the roam to, and that should localize where you're having uh, potential issues. But I don't know that there's any correlations, for instance, like a map and saying this is the location. You'd have to go back with the AP name. Okay. Okay. Um, these are the types of events, and there's a lot of data in here. Bad roam, we've got the thresholds below, suboptimal, good roam. Ping-ponging, how many times have you had a device sitting in some place that was just between two APs because they both looked great? Uh, I actually had one. We had one when I was at Cognio. I'd roam every time they opened a door. <laughs> and it was that close, and it was that bad. Uh, client disconnect. Clients disconnect. It's a good reason to know that you had a roaming failure because you walked out in the parking lot where I don't have an access point. How, how do you measure roaming time? How do you measure roaming time? As in, what's it from and to? Well, when you disconnect from one AP and go to the next AP and come up as an authenticated client on that, that stops the clock on a roam. So what we're looking for is the time to leave an AP and become active on the next AP. Everything between that is measured. I guess, how do you determine when a client... Because the, the reason I ask the question is you can measure roaming time in lots of different ways. Okay. Is it from when a client goes off channel and the patch of scanning and looking for the channels because mm -hmm. um, that takes time and often or is it from the point when you see the first off packet on the new channel right or you can do it from the last day to pack it on one channel to the first set to pack it on the next packet there's lots of different ways of measuring roman specifically at that level i don't have a good answer for you okay yeah we can get you one though yeah okay <laughs> Jim. We... yes i'm over here Yes. <laughs> I have a question from social media. Okay. Um, so Jafar asks, if there's a larger event that affects multiple clients with the same issue, is that something that can be seen, like 108821 bones having the same issue kind of thing? Yeah, actually, in that, in that, and I'll go into this in the demo real quick, too, there is a all the clients together down on the bottom. That can be sorted by an AP. If you've got an event going on in an action, you can quickly group down to the APs and the clients that are having that issue. So that was in the detail down below. I focused a lot on what you're getting from that timeline, but there is full detail down below in a tabular format. What are your plans um, when it comes to extending this into the six gigahertz? Into the six gigahertz range, this is already there. Um, so an AP Rome to Rome is there. Uh, auto RF uh, features that I mentioned with the auto busy hour and the AI channel planning 
Uh, AI channel planning, we don't expect that to be a huge problem, but it is there also for 6 gigahertz interface. But any new features specifically for the 6 gigahertz? Not yet. Um, I anticipate that we're going to be adding some, some data around AFC and some of the other stuff that we're doing for standard power, but I don't have any information. Do you think that will happen this year? I can't say for certain okay. on the roadmap. I'm impressed with what we've got so far. Okay. <laughs> so it is, uh, it's an exciting time here. Um, first thing I'm going to show you is just the configurations for AI channel planning. There we go. All right, so you're going to drill down to global radio settings, auto RF. You've got two new features in there. We've got AI channel planning. AI channel planning is on or off. Uh, AI channel planning is on or it's off. When you turn it off, if it's, if it's off, it's still keeping track of how many jam channels you have, and that's system-wide, right? So if you're seeing DFS hits or jam channels, it's going to give you that information. When you transition to AI channel planning on, that information is still valid, but it's now logged for that AP, and it's going to assume from that point on you want to use the channel avoid list. So turning it on, turning it off, very straightforward. The thing I will point out to you is if you're wanting information on what's on that list, how long it's going to be on that list, you click in the upper right-hand corner and you pull a CSV document down that covers everything. You've got the AP name, the MAC, Serial number, what the event was, when the event started, when the event stops, and when you'll be back on and what state it's in. Damn. I mean, dang. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. That was that. And let me go over to... No, that's not what I wanted. Why would you not want to turn it on? I can't think of a reason why you might want to not tell it on. But as an old administrator, when you tell me to turn something on, the first thing I want to know is where's the off button? <laughs> yeah. um, and that's just a trust thing, right? So you're going to start again at the main menu. You're going to pick a client. Once you pick the client and the client drill down, you've got roaming beta. And that's the timeline. Drag it to an event. The event comes up. And I apologize for leaving that in the middle of it. Event comes up, gives you the detail of the event. In this case, we roamed from 60 to minus 75. It said that's a bad roam. The next was a good roam. As you cross across, you're going to see all of the events that happened. And this is in the drill down two minute selection. So we crossed a lot of APs in two minutes. I've got one that we were going to show up here was Justin, who did these wonderful demos, driving past the building. Uh, quick question. So you say like it went from next 60 to next 70 and that's a bad room. Is it, so trying to understand, is it is a bad room because it went from next 60 to next 70? Maybe that client had no other choice but to jump on that AP. Um, and, and as long as the performance is not affected and the client, you know, is that still a bad room or is it dependent on something else? It's a concern. Okay. So as okay. an administrator, if I've got a lot of clients that are doing that room and it's being flagged as a bad room, I probably need another AP over there, right? Or I may need another AP over there. All it says when it's bad is it fell below that threshold for bad, and bad right now is defined as you went to an AP that had lower power. But, so it's just based on the, low, the again, on the R side, or kind of like back to what Peter's question is, or is it somehow based on it took a longer time for it to roam or something like that? Because, I so, mean, a client can have an X70, and it can still be operating perfectly fine. Yeah, that, that seems like more like it's just a bad choice, not a bad roam. It, it's a bad choice, is exactly what it is. It's not a bad roam. We completed the roam. We didn't have a failure on it. We're associated. But it's bringing my attention to that it wasn't 10 dB better. It was actually worse. Okay. And that may be something I want to be aware of um, in a campus environment. These are the kinds of things, if I see groupings like that, mm -hmm. that goes into my planning because... I don't want that to become a problem. Right now it's not, but well, I don't. Well, well, will there be any indication that it, okay, I had it, you know, bad RSSI because there were no additional APs for the client to move to or something like that, possibly? Uh, it's possible. Insight? I would have to go drill down and take a look at this okay. and understand the context of it. That's, but that's me. I okay. do this a lot, right? The first place I'm going to is a map. If I see a cluster of these, I want to go to a map, find out, do I have an AP down over there first off, right? right? And that's the thing that still has to be correlated, which, by the way, 
before I retire, we're going to teach AI to do all that. Mm. Are you also detecting maybe when it's um, done a slow roam as opposed to a fast roam? Is that an event you can see? Yeah. No, the timing is on there. Actually, there's graduated for how long the roam I, takes. I guess I was meaning like yeah. it, it should be doing 802.11 air, but it's yes, actually sir. done full 802.1x. I've got one more thing to get to, but okay. what I did was all of the details on every one of these classifications is included in this deck, and I'm more than happy to talk about this offline afterwards. And Peter, just to answer your question real quick, uh, there is specifically protocol called out in the roaming table. Yeah, you will see OKC, the, non OKC, eleven R, non eleven yeah. R called out there. Okay. Yeah. All right. Last thing I need to touch on, and I've got precious little time left to do that. Uh, the MRI. Good news is there's only two slides here. <laughs> MRI is built into pretty much all of the uh, the later MR hardware and all of the new uh, CW hardware. Right now, the important thing to know about this is that this is baked into every AP. This isn't an overlay. I don't require any additional hardware. Its sole job is to continue to test your network for SSIDs, for authentication. Did it get an IP address? Onboarding was smooth and reporting on those details back to you. This is over the air. Yes, it's going to be between the APs. The focus here is on whether that service is delivering, the timing of that service delivery, and whether you have a problem or not. We all know that in Wi-Fi, everything that goes wrong on a network is the wireless, right? Okay. We also know as wireless professionals that there is an awful lot of not wireless that can make everybody say the wireless is broke. <laughs> so this is to test all those other things that aren't the RF in the air that are absolutely required to make this network usable. Comprehensive support, it's fully integrated. We've got the MR, CW, anything that's Wi-Fi 6 or 6 EAP from the Meraki time can actually do this function. This is fully integrated already into the AP level dashboard. If you notice the slider down on the timeline shows you the number of events, and this is at a network level that have passed and the status of those tests. Clicking on top of that is going to give you a drill down into that timeline, what APs were involved in those issues, and then you can drill straight down to the AP level and start doing a root cause analysis. And this is only for MRs? It doesn't include the Charlie Whiskies? No, it's just for the Wi-Fi 6, 6 APs uh, from an MR standpoint and all of the CW APs so far. So this is going forward, but it relies completely on the scanning radio that's built into those, those APs to run these tests. And if my primary SSID is EPTLS enabled, I'll be able to provision a certificate for it to validate the complete authentication stack? We are authenticating and going online with that, that SSID. So it measures just what the client's measuring going online as a client. But I mean, I'll be able to provision a certificate and basically download it to the AP so that it can use a certificate to authenticate to the network. Yes. That is coming. So in the okay. first phase, you will not have that and this gets, gets launched, but you will see that coming because that's absolutely on our plan to bring it on. Yes, not today. Another question from Social. Is there a threshold for how close the AP you are testing to and from can be? You've got to have RF connectivity. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but At but, the, but no, at the ceiling, close. this is a lot yeah. better. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, it has to be an AP that you can connect to. And will it randomly pick a neighboring AP? Or no, I've got a list of three APs that I can put on there. I've got control over the tests that I'm running, time frame. So there's a lot of detail that's coming into this. This is brand new. It's not out yet. So I was just kind of giving you a sneak peek to it. Okay. okay.